How many of us would love to get one last letter from a loved one? Sadly, this is something that never really happened to some people whose loved ones went off to fight during World War II. I was about to say World War I, but I meant to say World War II. Uh, a lot of people died during that war, and their final words to their loved ones was all the closure that you know those loved ones could have today i am actually bringing you the black site files from unsolved mysteries the case of the undelivered world war ii letters basically an exterminator was uh doing his rounds at a nice house he came across a bag full of these letters thankfully to that exterminator a lot of people who never thought that they were going to get another letter from their loved ones who went off and died in World War II finally got a little bit of closure. Let's get to that case viewing, but we're going to do that right after these commercials, and I will be right back. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tina Louise, and I want everyone to know why I use new improved Arid Extra Dry to help keep me dry. New Arid is safe for the ozone layer, so it's better for you because New Arid has no fluorocarbon gases. And when it comes to protection, New Arid has what it takes, an aluminum chlorohydrate formula that really works against wetness. Take it from Tina. Use new improved Arid Extra Dry daily. The spray that says safe for the ozone, right on the can. Announcing a fantastic offer, the great $5 rebate from Mr. Coffee. Right now, I'll send you a $5 check with my signature on it just for buying any Mr. Coffee with Coffee Saver. An extra $5 back. It's another delicious way to save coffee and money with Mr. Coffee. Check your store today for details on the great $5 rebate from Mr. Coffee. Welcome back to the show, ladies and gentlemen. Up next, we have the case viewing of the uh, Undelivered World War II letters. If you are new to this series, basically, this is where I go to the Unsolved Mysteries Wiki. And we have my secretary, the very vivacious, yes, I'm using a different word this time, very vivacious Jasmine here to actually read to us the... Uh, the events of what happened basically as that was written down on the unsolved mysteries wiki so basically i use a wrong one let's switch over to hold on one second i'm still getting everything set up from uh the triple mo for going from the dual monitor setup to the triple let's see here is it primary yep there we go so basically she is going to read this and uh, you know, and we'll see what, if there's been any more updates and everything. Now, there was, I will go on and say that the, this, you know, the letters did find their way to everyone, but I'm not sure there's been any more updates besides that. So let's continue on, shall we? So I will pick up that this first part, uh, Undelivered World War, World War II letters. The key, real name is unknown because there was a lot of people that were involved in these with all these letters. This was actually uh, done as a lost heir. The location that these letters were found were, was in Raleigh, North Carolina. And the date that they were found was February 4th, 1986, it looks like. Now, I'm not sure if February 4th, 1986 is when they were found. I think that could have been when the letters were found or, if this, or when they were all delivered. But we will find out. So, basically, I have uh, the... Oh, read aloud program basically read it so let's do this let's go down select this much and then we'll start here and it may take a second for the program to catch on during world war ii thousands of u.s soldiers said goodbye to their loved ones and made a parting promise to write home as often as possible their letters carried by the military v-mail victory mail service were the only link between them and their families. Established in June 1942, the service provided free airmail privileges to servicemen. Some of these soldiers would return, but others would not. For the relatives of those soldiers lost in battle, the last letter home became a precious keepsake, a memory of lost love. And this is kind of what I was talking about, how sometimes 
these letters are literally seen as like like the final goodbye for these family members. I'll be honest with my mom dead, you know, I wish I could have like either a letter or just like 10 more minutes to talk to my mom, you know. But sadly, sometimes things like that just are not in the, you know, in the cards for us. Let's go down here. And it takes some time, like I said, for it to pick up and start reading. 41 years after the war ended, on February 4, 1986, Terminex Pest Exterminator Mike Minguez was spraying the attic in a 90-year-old woman's house in Raleigh, North Carolina. In the corner, he saw some letters spilling from a laundry bag. He had, in fact, discovered a military duffel bag filled with hundreds of unopened letters written by soldiers during World War II. The longer Mike looked, the more incredulous he became. There was something about the insignia across the letters that made him curious. He had never seen V-mail before, but he had heard the term and knew that, generally, anything with V in it was World War II vintage. It soon became apparent to him that something was not right. So basically, uh, all right, hold on, never mind, I'm still reading. My bad. Mike learned that the elderly woman had a nephew who had been a crew member aboard the SS Caleb Strong when it left Newport News, Virginia, on May 3, 1944, bound for Oran, Algeria, in North Africa, arriving there on May 21. 92 soldiers on board had written 235 letters home and stuffed them into the duffel bee. She meant to say duffel bag. So it's kind of amazing that what happens in 42 years because it was 42 years after when these letters were located uh, you know were basically located because the, the said up here was the February 4th 1986 I wasn't sure that that was when the letters were delivered or if that's when they were found but it looks like it was when they were found but yeah 42 years holy shit Look, think of what can happen in 42 years for a normal person you know like they have a family, they may die, or they, you know, it's just, it's really amazing what can happen, you know. Okay, let's, let's go down this far. Okay. Gee, the woman's nephew had vowed to mail the letters when he returned to the United States, but he had forgotten. Overcome by shame and fear when he discovered his mistake, he hid them in her attic. He died around 1980, and the woman had been too embarrassed and scared to say anything. After promising never to reveal her name, Mike convinced the woman to release the letters to him when he visited her again in May 1986. After trying unsuccessfully to track down the letters recipients himself, Mike contacted the U.S. Postal Service in Washington, D.C. Mike was initially hesitant to turn over the letters because he feared they would end up in the dead letter office. However, the Postal Service assured him that they would try to deliver the letters. On June 6, 1986, he brought them to Raleigh Postmaster Ross Garlusky. Ross then sent the letters to Meg Harris, Media Relations Officer of the Postal Service. 92 soldiers on board the Caleb Strong had written letters to over 150 friends and family at 117 addresses in 34 states. One by one, the Postal Service delivered the letters from 89 of the soldiers. Only three could not be tracked down. Meg was prohibited by law from opening the letters. All she had to work with was the information on the envelopes. She worked with the Veterans Administration and the National Archives and contacted postmasters and veterans groups across the country. She decided it would be easier to track down the soldiers themselves rather than the letters wreck. Uh, letters recipients, that's what the program went to say. Honestly, I... Although, you know, people would be upset for the person forgetting, you know, and then being embarrassed for not mailing the letters... I kind of, I'm not that, I'm not that mad, you know, the fact is that, you know, people were stressed after, you know, it, it's proven that people get stressed after any war 
or conflict that they serve in. <clears throat> What's there to say that the person did not start suffering from PTSD after World War II, and they, during that time, they just kind of, you know, they they had to kind of distance themselves from what they did in the, in the war, you know. It's sad that the letters were forgotten, yeah, but it isn't something to be, like, upset over, you know. And and ultimately, what we can take out of this is, though, ultimately, everybody that these letters were needing to go to were actually located. That is what matters. You know, it may have been a little bit later, but later is better than never, I guess you could say, right? Okay. Well, I cannot believe that. I'll... I'll all those letters, well, they were really writing when they had their free time, weren't they? Okay, let's... There we go. Pience. Meg had to be careful when she started telling the recipients and soldiers about the mail. She did it slowly because she did not want anyone to go into shock. She felt a lot of the closeness of family ties. She realized how much people care for each other and continue caring, even after 40 years. John Dietz was the first soldier to receive his letters, which he had written to his father and then girlfriend. The ensuing publicity put him in contact with old friends he had not heard from in decades. He also heard from the widow of James Bowles, a fellow soldier on the Caleb Strong. While together, John and James tore a $1 bill in half and kept one half as a gesture of friendship. The two planned to get together after the war but never did. James' widow told John that she still had James' half of the $1 bill. Several letters were delivered in a ceremony at Postal Service Headquarters on July 21, 1986. POW Robert Kirsch had written to his parents and girlfriend. Manford Paines had written to his future wife. Raul Alvarez had also written to his future wife, Terry, saying, I love you with all my heart and no one will come between us. I picture ourselves together again. Coincidentally, Raul later became a mail carrier. As a result of news stories about the letters, he was reunited with two of his W. Two of his war buddies, uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm kind of focusing on one thing, and, and it's not right to everybody watching this, but if I got a letter from, you know, my father or something, if he died in World War II, you know, I would not be so, I wouldn't be that upset at the person for forgetting, you know, I would, I would been, I would simply be happy that I got one last correspondence from my father, I, you know, that would have been like, that would really have, you know, made me feel good. I think ultimately it just shows that we're all human. We all make mistakes. Okay, let's see here. Let's continue on down here. Our buddies. Sadly, several of the soldiers who wrote the letters have since passed away. Private Roland Pooler had written several letters home while on the Caleb Strong. Both before and following the war, he worked as a teacher. He died in 1966. His widow, Marwill, received the letters at a ceremony in October 1986. When she read them, she laughed and cried. U.S. Army Private Lyman Fisk had written a letter to his mother on May 14, 1944. Dear Mom, well... Today is Mother's Day. Though I know it will be quite some time before you receive this, I want you to know that I haven't forgotten you. I hope this is the last time that I am so far away from you. Love, Lyman. Lyman died in 1976, and his mother died around 1970. His daughter, Diane Bloomberg, found out about the letter after her friend saw Lyman's name in an article about the case. Diane was four months old when the letter was written. On Veterans Day, 1986, she received the letter. Reading it brought back nice memories of Lyman. Tragically, the discovery of the letters indirectly led to the death of one of the soldiers. 
Sailor Ken Heinrich called Army Private William Croft after reading about the discovery. Within minutes, William collapsed and died of a heart attack. Five days after his funeral, the letter he had written to his mother, also deceased, was delivered to his. Okay, it says his widow, Juanita. I think that's kind of a low blow to literally... Uh, see, where was it? I think it was a little bit of a low blow to claim that these letters led to the death of a soldier. To me, that... that no, nah, I don't think that it did. I think... I think, you know... I think he, it, you know, when it's your time to pass away, it's your time to pass away. My mom passed away from a heart attack. Uh, I don't think, I don't think getting a letter, simply getting a letter causes a heart attack. If anything, I think uh, it may have put a smile on his face because he got that one last letter. I don't think that, uh, the letter led to the person's death. Whoever put, you know, I'm not, I can't recall if this was actually taken from the vi the uh, video itself because what these wikis are is somebody actually watches the cases and they literally take the time and type everything out. So I'm not sure if this is actually something that every somebody actually put in in the show or if this is just what somebody decided to type from the wiki. But yeah, I totally disagree with that. Uh, when it's, when it's their time, it's their time, and it, it's kind of sad to blame the letter on a person having a heart attack. Very poor taste, in my opinion. Okay, let's go down here. Mm, there we go. Ida Juanita. Air Force Staff Sergeant Frank Rapley, A.B., 17 turret gunner, had written a letter to his wife, Merrill Page Rapley, whom he married on December 5, 1942. The letter read, Still at sea, May 1944. My precious wife. Darling, I sure miss you. I wish I were back with you right now. It seems so hard to write you, as all I can think of is how I love you and long to be with you. The boat is rocking, so I can't write too neatly. Meryl, darling, I love you and hope that we'll soon be together for good. From what information we can gather, I believe the big invasion of Europe is on. So I'll be stuck overseas until the war is over. I love you, my darling. Your husband, Frank. On July 21st, 1944, two months after he had written the letter, Frank was killed when his plane was shot down over Stair, Austria. He was 25. Two years later, his body was brought back to the United States for burial. Merrill, a retired teacher, never remarried. She has been a widow for over 40 years. She loved her husband. I can respect that. On September 4, 1986, in a surprising and poignant moment, Merrill received Frank's last letter. She was shocked and torn all to pieces. Reading the letter made her feel like they were still together and he was talking to her. She said it was the most wonderful letter she had ever received from him, even though all of his letters were very dear to her. She said that receiving another letter from a man she still loves after waiting for over 40 years was something that only God could understand the depth of. Uh, understand the depth of the meaning of it. Uh, if you hear sirens, I'm sorry. Something's going on outside right now. Okay, let's go down to here. He meaning of it. For Merrill, the short two and a half years she had with Frank were equal to a lifetime for her, which is why she never remarried. She felt that nobody else could ever replace him. She has every letter he has ever written to her, but the new letter is the most special one. Staff Sergeant Sumter Grubb had written a letter to his wife, Margaret Peggy Kimball, Hiya Sweets, just another line today, as I'm always thinking about you and may not be able to write for a few days. Haven't seen land yet, but expect to soon. 
There is about six hours difference in time here, so I often try to think of where you are and what you might be doing. I guess that is natural. Your ever-loving and faithful husband. Peggy said the letter is always touching. It causes her to think back on their time together. The two had met on a blind date arranged by friends. She said he was witty, affectionate, and thoughtful. After dating for a year and a half, they married. Six years later, he left to become a gun. A gunner in the Air Force. Okay, let's finish off this portion. We're almost done, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> God damn, those sirens are really going off right now. Um, read aloud, okay. Er in the Air Force. Sumter wrote his last words to Peggy on May 19th, 1944. Two months later, on July 7th, he was killed in a plane crash in Italy while in combat. But his words would not die. They finally reached Peggy on December 12, 1986. Merrill and Peggy are just two of the 89 people who received their special delivery from across the years. But seven letters from three servicemen on the Caleb Strong are still undelivered. Post office regulations dictate that unsolved mysteries cannot reveal the recipients of the letters. But they can reveal the names of the soldiers who wrote them. Private John J. Thomas wrote four letters to Garfield Heights, Ohio, Lindhurst, Ohio, Kent, Ohio, and Babson Park, Massachusetts. Sergeant C.F. Smith wrote two letters to Philadelphia and Darby, Pennsylvania. Morris Johnson wrote one letter to Saw. Uh, San Francisco, California, that's what the program said. We can't tell you who the letters went to, but we can tell you about the state, where they were going to. <laughs> they could have just literally said that we cannot disclose the information of who the people are, and they could have just left it at that, you know. Because anybody who knows how to, you know, like a private detective or anything, all they have to do is kind of, uh, you know, look at the name John J. Thomas and then, like, let's say Garfield Heights and see what they have in common. It's not that hard to track down people. Okay, so thank you, Jasmine. Let's see here. Hold on. How much do I have left? Oh, well, we still got a few things. So I'm actually going to keep Jasmine here for a little bit longer while I read the extra notes. Extra notes. This case first aired on the no May 6, 1988 special number 6 episode of Unsolved Mysteries. During the filming of the show, Merrill Rapley met with Mike Mingus and thanked him for the let uh, for finding the letters. Like I said, not it t if you're going to be mad <clears throat> at somebody, you know, because they felt embarrassed or they simply forgot something over the passage of time. You know, really, you should find other things to be mad at, you know. Uh, baseball player Walt Droppo was aboard the Caleb Strong and had written one of the letters to his mother. I never even heard of that baseball player. Good for him. Uh, some uh, sources state 93 soldiers on the Caleb Strong wrote 237 letters when the war was over. The elderly woman's nephew figured it was too late to mail the letters, and the bag was found in April 1986. Okay, let's continue on reading this. Let's go down here. Solved. In the spring of 1988, the Postal Service contacted James Althoff, president of the 781st Bombardment Squadron Association, and asked for help in searching for the final three soldiers, John Thomas, Morris Johnson, and C.F. Smith. In May, James began a search for Morris. Members of the association canvassed San Francisco, but Morris had left no forwarding address. James contacted the Veterans Administration and learned that Morris had died in 1966. James obtained Morris' death certificate, which listed an address in Fresno, California. He then contacted the funeral home that handled Morris' burial. An employee there knew Morris and gave James contact information for Morris' daughter, Karen Johnson.
In September 1988, James contacted Karen. He learned that Morris and his wife, Roberta, had met on a blind date in San Francisco and married in 1939. The letter Morris had written while on the Caleb Strong was addressed to Roberta. Karen said Morris was a romantic who always gave Roberta gifts. A master sergeant in the U.S. Army, Morris later received a silver star, a bronze star, and a purple heart. After the war, he became a pharmacist. Pharmacist. A pharmacist. He became a pharmacist. Okay. T. Sadly, Roberta died in 1984. On November 21st, 1988, Morris' letter was delivered to Karen at her home in Fresno. She and her siblings opened the letter on Thanksgiving Day. She said she was interested in reading it because she misses her parents a lot. In the fall of 1988, James contacted Walter Longacre, also of the 781st Bombardment Squadron Association, to help locate John Thomas's family. Walter had previously helped track down several veterans to inform them about reunions. He obtained a death certificate for John from the Division of Vital Statistics of Ohio, John's home state. He then wrote to the funeral home that handled John's services. The funeral home sent Walter obituaries for John and his wife, who had died two days after him. Through the obituaries, Walter was able to locate John's closest living relative, his brother-in-law. He also located two of the women whom John had written to, Pearl Kohler Adrian and Dorothy Seckler. Both were interested in seeing the letters. The Postal Service gave the letters to John's brother-in-law, who agreed to give them to the... Give them to the woman. You know, uh, for the, the part where they talked about how she waited to open the letter till Thanksgiving, that has to be quite a nice present, you know, because she missed her parents and, you know, she... Think, uh, like last Thanksgiving gift that she's going to have from her parents was that letter, which is which is very touching. Okay, let's see here. Let's just go all the way down here. We're just about done. Omen. In John's letter to Pearl, he said he enjoyed the time he spent with her. Unfortunately, she did not remember him, but she believed they had gone out a few times. She was happy to receive the letter, as it helped bring back memories of her youth. The Postal Service had the most difficulty finding C.F. Smith and delivering his letters, which he had written to his girlfriend, Ruth, and his mother, because Smith is a very common last name, and they did not have his full name. Also, some of his military records were destroyed in a fire at the Federal Records Center in St. Louis, Missouri. The Postal Service sought help from veteran Pierre Kennedy, founding director of the 781st Bombardment Squadron Association. He found information about CF through the National Archives list of air crews reported missing during World War II. Pierre learned that C.F.'s full name was Clarence F. Smith. Before the war, he lived in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He was a tail gunner on AB, 17 Flying Fortress, and was killed when the plane was shot down over Verona, Italy, on July 6, 1944. He was 26. He was initially buried in Italy, but was later buried in Philadelphia after the war ended. Pierre located Clarence's mother's old address in Philadelphia and, through neighbors, learned of Clarence's brother, Norman Smith of Henderson, Maryland. He also learned that their mother had died in 1981. On February 22, 1989, Postmaster General Anthony Frank presented Clarence's letters to Norman at a ceremony in Washington, D.C., marking the completion of the deliveries. Norman thanked Mike Minguez for finding the letters and Pierre for tracking him down. He said the letters brought back many memories of Clarence. At the ceremony, Norman read Clarence's letter to their mother. Okay. 
Come on, don't, don't, don't. Quit. Hello, mother. I sure hope you are all well today. Maybe the last letter you will receive from me here, so don't worry if you don't hear from me for a while. Well, today I spent most of my time playing cards and checkers, two exciting games. Boy, I sure will be glad to see payday around. We haven't been paid for two months. Well, I'll close now, all right. As soon as I am able, take good care of yourself. I sure hope there is mail by the time I land. Good night, all your son. I love you, buddy. On April 13th, 1990, Peggy Kimball passed away at the age of 76. On August 24th, Meryl Rapley passed away at the age of... Uh, she passed away at the age of 75. Wow, I'm not sure what it was, but did you notice that the reading program just sped up really quickly when it was reading the letter here? You know, like, oh my god, that was quick. So sadly, uh, Peggy passed away, as did Meryl passed away. But the thing is, we can all take, we can all take, you know, heart in the idea that they got their, you know, they got the letters before they passed away, so they were able to have a little bit of closure from their loved ones. Okay, so let's, we got, uh, Meryl Rapley at Find a Grave. Hold on, let me just go back through here and make sure there's no other Find a Graves. Okay, nope, we just have Meryl Rapley, so. Ev Everett Meryl Page Rapley. She was born June 7th, 1917 in Riddleville, Washington County, Georgia, USA. She passed away August 24th 1990 she was 73 years of age in Augusta Richmond County Georgia USA she was buried at the Brownwood Cemetery uh, in Sandersville Washington County Georgia USA and then it gives a little bit of her details here uh, her, her uh, parents father was uh, Reverend James Gaynor Page 1878 Wow to 1944. I want to say that his birth is the oldest out of all these cases I've ever covered, but it, it's up there. 1878. It, it, I'm always in awe when you know you look at uh, you look at their like their birth dates, and it's over 100 years old. It, it's just kind of it's really kind of it's kind of amazing, honestly. Her mother was Leah Pearl. Jones, Josie Page, eighteen eighty-seven to nineteen fifty-four. Her, she had two siblings: Joseph Cecil Page, nineteen ten to nineteen seventy-two, and William Maurice Page, nineteen thirteen to nineteen fifty-four. Her spouse was Sergeant Frank Alexander Rapley, uh, born nineteen nineteen. Uh, date of death was nineteen forty-four. They were married in nineteen, or yeah, married in nineteen forty-two. Sorry. Okay, let's take a look at the photos. Okay, here is a nice portrait of Meryl. Here's her resting place. Actually, this is one of the more uh, one of the more exquisite tombstones I've ever seen. And then finally, here is Meryl and her husband. Okay, so that marks the end of the case viewing. I just want to say thank you to Jasmine for reading to us this case. And when I return, ladies and gentlemen, it will be with the final thoughts of this case. So stay tuned, and I will be right back. If everything you need to make your very best home-baked cookies, even Nestle Real Chocolate Morsels, was put all together, what would you call it? Nestle Cookie Mix. Nestle gives you a head start. You add the things that should be fresh, an egg and butter. It's just like baking from scratch, except Nestle gives you a head start. Cookies, Daddy? Already? Mm -hmm. mm. Give yourself a head start on great-tasting home-baked cookies with Nestle Cookie Mix. The Other Side of the Mountain, Part 2, is the continuing true story of Jill Kinmont. As romantic and joyful, as tender, I'll never leave you. moving and beautiful, Tell me what's the matter. as any love story ever imagined. For everyone who believes in happy endings, The Other Side of the Mountain, Part 2, Rated PG. Now playing at a theater near you. 
Alrighty, everybody, welcome back. It is now time for the final thoughts, and overall, I cannot think of a, you know, more happy ending to this story. Uh, it's rare that you get a really heartfelt story in uh, Unsolved Mysteries, and because a lot of it is kind of, kind of gloomy stuff. Murders, alien abductions, ghosts that terrorize people. So when you get a case that is actually that kind of, you know, it's a kind of a feel good story. It's something that really kind of makes me feel, you know, feel feel a little bit good. It makes my heart beat a little bit more, I guess you could say. Uh, it really goes to show like how one little one little encounter can change a lot of stuff. Because the lady who originally held these letters because she was embarrassed to let anybody know. Those letters would probably would have been ultimately destroyed if it was not for the exterminator. It was only due to the exterminator and his ability to convince the lady to let him take over care, you know, to take care of uh, our possession of those letters or whatever, however you want to say it. If it was because of that that these letters ultimately got, you know, got get were given to the intended people that they were meant for. But yeah, so I'm very happy about that. I wish we could actually have a lot more of these feel-good stories, but ultimately we don't. There is one case now that I'm now that I'm thinking that I'm not sure if it was ever solved. It was also kind of a feel-good story, but I think it was way in the later towards the end of Unsolved Mysteries, if I remember correctly. I can't recall when it was though, but it was about uh, a husband and wife. I think it was in Florida somewhere that uh, they really did not have that much in the way of money. And they were, I think it could have been like either a Saturday or a Sunday. They got done working and uh, I think they were having, getting ready for lunch. I may be wrong. But a person came to their door and he looked really disheveled. They decided to give him, uh, the give him, make him a sandwich. So they made uh, him a sandwich. The husband sat with the stranger on the porch, I think. While the the guy was slowly eating his sandwich and that they were talking and everything. The uh, husband and wife decided to give him some money, you know, for his journey wherever he was going. And then after that, for a few years, I think it was every Christmas, uh, he would, uh, they were, a, a Christmas card would be sent to them. And the Christmas card, I think it had like a $100 bill in it every time. So, you know, that's another feel-good story. The sad thing is, I don't think that person was ever identified. But I cannot wait to profile that case whenever it is I get get to it. Uh, but yeah, so I, I'm, I'm just happy that we get, you know, some of these feel-good stories now and then. I'll be honest, I'm not really much of a happy endings person because I don't feel that happy endings really do exist. But if you do believe in them, you know, then this is a good example of them. Uh... It's just, it's just I'm very cynical, I guess you could say. But just because I'm cynical doesn't mean that I should think that they don't happen. They do happen. It's just, it's hard for me to believe it, though, I guess you could say. But anyway, uh, I cannot wait to get to the next, you know, episodes. The next episodes of Unsolved Mysteries here. Let me check real quickly. Hold on, let me pull up the, uh, okay, hold on. I'm going to pause this real quick so I can pull up a display capture. I will be right back. Okay, everybody, I am back. So, uh, I am looking at the uh, schedule for uh, Unsolved Mysteries, the Black Site un uh, Files from Unsolved Mysteries. And it actually looks like on this coming Monday, April 1st, and the a.m. and p.m., we actually have two cases that I'm going to be covering. So, uh, up next, we have the case of Doreen Picard. I'm not, I can't recall that case at all. I just can't remember it. And then if you are a fan of treasure treasure hunters, we have the case of Beale's treasure. And it's a, it's a treasure case. That's all I can really say. I know it's generic, but I can't recall that much about this one either. So if you guys can hold off until the first, which is only tomorrow, by the way. It's only tomorrow. Uh, you know, we'll be having a couple more uh, black site files, and I cannot wait to get to them for all of you people. So, my name is Jeff, aka I'm going to back on out, and when I see you tomorrow, it will be with some more black site. That's right, we're going back into the black site. 
So I'm going to bounce and get ready for my Easter brunch, and I will see you all later. Take it easy, everybody. Stay safe, and happy Easter.